I'm Joseph. And I'm Nick. And this is Fish Jelly. Sure in the hell is. We're on Zoom because Nick is in New York. Why are you in New York? Um, I, for fun. No, I, I came here to do two. Well, it happened that I did two interviews, but I came here to specifically do one interview. And that was with the uh, incomparable Parker Posey. How was that? It was amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know how much you want to talk about it since there will be an article to read about it later. <laughs> there will be. It has to be transcribed, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but yeah, it was a, a very gracious interview, it was an intimate. And uh, yeah, and I, I, I'm still can't believe it happened. And then what was the other interview? Uh, the same day, Jim Jarmusch and Carter Logan, uh, for their they put out a record for their band Squirrel, or that's about to come out. They're for a full length record, and um, so yes, I also interviewed them, and that but that was uh, online. Got it. How are Even you? Feeling? Both in the area. No. Oh. I said, "How are you feeling?" I'm a bit. I'm good. Tired yeah but good how about you well, up early as always mm -hmm. um, so I think in the last live we talked about like relationships I think I don't know there were a lot of comments about it and then someone sent me like a BuzzFeed article to comment on which I think it was titled like the downsides of being married but then really it's about like 22 people talking about like the article's titled like 22 people shared the harsh realities of marriage that no one talks about harsh well, i read these i don't know that these are that interesting and they're kind of repetitive and certainly obvious there was nothing in this that i thought was like who would ever think well, that's not true, but so I don't, I feel like I have to at least mention it, but I mean, it has things on here, like when one person is messy and the other is neat. Okay. I mean, that's a lot of different relationships, roommates, coworkers, <laughs> having to split the holidays between the in-laws and always having someone mad because you can't be at two places at once. You know what I was thinking about that? I feel like that also applies to single people as adults. Because I think at some point you can't be expected to spend every holiday with your family. Like you want to make your own traditions or not. So Yeah, I don't I don't want to go goddamn go home every Christmas. Uh and also what if your parents you know, if the if both members of the couple have divorced parents and then it's just compounded isn't there a movie about that with reese witherspoon four christmases is there well that, I'll, I'll, that i've never watched it. Me think like you know some people only see their families on christmas so to me it's like if you only see your family on christmas uh christmas i mean is it really that important to even see them that one time i mean <laughs> you could find other times to see them um yeah, a lot of these were, like, one of them is about sharing a bedroom, but I would assume that most people think when you get married, you have to share a bedroom. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to say about these. I'm, I'm not sure what they wanted me to say. Um, Make sure you have a comfortable bed. Finding out that your in-laws are really awful human beings. Um I mean, I guess that would be shocking if you're in a relationship with someone who's like a nice person and then you find out they come from trash. But I feel like that's not an uncommon thing. I don't know. Uh, no, uh, I think that that there needs to be something more complex, I think, written on that same subject, maybe perhaps about why would you expose your significant other to some to toxic people, perhaps. But yeah. For better or, or worse includes the worse. Like, yeah, it, it's in the statement. So I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I'm being difficult with these, but 
I mean, I don't expect BuzzFeed to be that engaging, but was this written by somebody that's not married, maybe? And well, you know what they do because they try to do. I mean, they have a new article every day, so they just pull quotes from like Twitter or wherever, and then make an article out of it. But um, another one is not being able to independently decide to move somewhere, take a new job, or randomly switch up um, aspects of your life because you feel like it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel like that's also obvious, like, I don't know. No, you know, BuzzFeed, you don't, it's like, you don't need to speak every day. You don't need to talk every no. day. You take I mean, some of, yeah, some of these are so obvious, like when you go through rough patches with your spouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's a thing that happens. <laughs> I guess because it, your spouse isn't a robot, Jesus. Compromising is not always great. Nope. Uh, when oh my gosh when the two of you change differently over time in a way that becomes less compatible yep yep I would expect people to change as they get older and live like, more like butterflies the one thing th there was one that really stuck out to me and it was this one having to decide what to eat every night for the rest of your life while also trying to accommodate the other that sure, would sure. Yeah, that would have been something I would have said, like, it, it, that would never have occurred to me that, like, my diet and what I eat is going to be, like, like a regular topic that I have to think about when previously I didn't. But yeah, and then they just get repetitive. So, so there you go to the person who wanted me to talk about that. But moving on, um, you wanted to talk about can. Oh, well, there, you know, I think on the Thursday, April 13th is when the official lineups being announced, which, you know, is an exciting time of year for me. And uh, but some other titles have leaked uh, as like two for sure that the the festival has sent out emails about the Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon is going to be in can no word of it's in competition yet, as well as um Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, and they're doing a Harrison Ford tribute. That most assuredly will not be in competition. But um, and then the opener was announced, which is interesting. It's My Wen's uh, Jean Duberry, which stars Johnny Depp. Uh, which uh, there will be some controversy about. And I was also reading there was some controversy about My Wen. Uh, some some. A, a, a complaint was filed against her in France by some waiter at a restaurant. She apparently spit in their face. Oh. <laughs> My wen, what you doing? Uh, I'm not excited for Jean Duberry, but uh, I'm... yeah. Anyway, that that's happening. And then, of course, uh, there are several many sources basically certifying, again, the festival doesn't announce till Thursday, but that Wes Anderson's new movie Asteroid City is going to be there, and it's uh, it's believed that Woody Allen's French film that he finished making, uh, which Early Buzz is really great on, that that that's going to be there. Oh, okay. Um, I thought I would mention it here and not in the films we watch for fun because you didn't watch all of it, but I watched Monique's Netflix comedy special. My name is Monique. And you caught like the tail end of it. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe people remember she made a big stink about Netflix not offering her the kind of money they were offering Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, Amy Schumer. So she made a big deal about that. And now she has a Netflix special. I'm assuming they upped her money. Uh, but my, I don't know. So the big thing about the special, besides that she did want after complaining about Netflix not giving her her money, is that she comes out as queer in the Netflix special. What did you think about that? Because I have thoughts. I thought, I think I already thought that. I already knew that she kind of had an arrangement with her husband and she's been vocal about not being... Yeah, yeah, about how about proclivities, I guess. I, it, to me, that wasn't really a surprise. Um, and again, I didn't watch the whole thing. I caught the tail end. But I will say that I thought 
the la- the closing segment is rather touching. Um, yeah. and, and I actually really quite enjoyed that. And I would go back and watch the rest, but, uh, and she looked really good. I thought she does look really good. Um, she doesn't say she's queer in the special. She says that she wants to be sexual with women. Mm-hmm. But then she also says, like, she doesn't want to do anything to them. They can do stuff to her. So I think I wasn't surprised because I think people who follow her know that she's had, like, an open marriage for a long time. So if you put two and two to get, well, if you if you put two and one together, you get three. Like, I mean, it what she's saying doesn't really um, surprise me. So I kind of... I mean, for headlines to say she came out as queer is kind of like, she didn't use that word. I mean, she gave us more than Queen Latifah has about. True. But, but, uh, but my other thought is like, you know, I, my, I like Monique from the Queens of Comedy and the Parkers. mm -hmm. And I recall having my attitude about her change when she did a, she did a comedy special from a women's prison, like, years and years ago and that's when i got this vibe that she kind of thinks she's like a she almost has like a preachy quality to her yeah that i find a little obnoxious and then you really see it in her bet talk show Uh everything was like baby let me tell you and blah i just i don't know i never found monique someone like who's aspirational like I don't know why she feels the need to preach to me she is not Dr. Maya Angelou like I don't really know (laughs) which I'm now that I say that it's funny because in the special she talks about how she also reveals another secret that no one is supposed to know which is that she was in special education in grades seven eight and nine and that her mother was illiterate so um but anyway she yeah I don't I kind of feel like with this special she was trying really hard maybe to give us something yeah so she made this big stink about how netflix doesn't think she's worth millions of dollars so she was trying really hard to give us something and i just wish she would tone it down sometimes <laughs> like <laughs> she is on 10 like all the time yeah yeah it's a little exhausting also her use of the n-word to me is excessive like it gets to a point where it's just like God. <laughs> She's yes, but uh, and again, I'm not tell, yeah, I'm not gonna tell her she can't use it, but like it, it's a lot. She's not on a ten in the same way as like Jennifer Lewis. Well, if she were, yeah. she'd be unbear- she'd be unbearable. <laughs> um, no, you know, I I think it 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 felt like watching this now, say after the Gerard Carmichael special, yeah, where. He- where he comes out, uh, I I wonder if that and it got a lot of attention, right? So I wonder if that's kind of now a that's going to be a thing we see a lot where people feel pressured that they have to do something like that. Well, that's what I was feeling that she felt pressure to give something, and that is something she could give that would get attention. Because then, of course, you know she needs to support this special with streams right like she complained about not getting paid and the reason netflix didn't want to pay her is because they didn't believe that she would get the engagement that someone like chris rock dave Chappelle, or amy schumer would get so she has to do something to get people to watch so these headlines about her being queer or however they want to word it definitely provides that clickbaity aspect to it i just you know her talking about her gay uncle and her lesbian aunt and how the grandmother didn't accept them and it it was very touching it was touching because she also kind of comes out hard against the church which i appreciated that that resonated with me yeah i would give it like three and a half out of five i thought it was very good if if she would not be so extra it would definitely be in like the excellent status, but because she's so extra, it makes her not a good storyteller. Yeah, but still, that was better than that that raggedy Amy Schumer Netflix special. Remember that? That was bad. Well, I don't feature her in any way, anyway. So I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't enjoy it. I, I don't think this is better. Yeah, you know? but 
uh, yeah, I, yeah. The the I won't rate it because I haven't seen the whole thing. But the bit I saw, I I did enjoy. All right, moving on to films that were released we didn't cover. Fist of the Condor. Yes, I, I believe a documentary by Ernesto Diaz Espinosa. It's about a group of martial artists from around the world who search for a book that contains the ancient secrets of how to overcome the limits of the human body. The Super Mario Brothers movie? That cartoon with a whole bunch of people doing voice work. Uh, yeah, I don't think either of us were really interested in seeing that because we skipped it. Yeah, I had zero interest in it. Um, I would have watched Chupa, which I'm assuming is about Chupacabra. It is. Um, and it's directed by Alfonso Cuaron's son, Jonas, Jonas Cuaron, um, whose last film, whose debut, I'm forgetting the, the title of it now, several years back, starred Jeffrey Dean Morgan, and I really didn't like it. But his new film stars Demian Bashir and Christian Slater. And I believe it's about a kid that finds Chupacabra. Yeah. But but I, it's not a horror film. Oh, oh. Hmm. Based on the poster that I saw, but I would watch that. It's Netflix release. Oh, How to Blow Up a Pipeline? Uh, the, the film about the disrupting the construction of the oil pipeline is a documentary directed by Daniel Goldhaber, uh, which I find interesting that he did that because I'm familiar with a previous film he did called Cam, which is uh, a horror film. Uh, so it's an interesting uh, change of pace for him. But that that opened. Uh, Joyland. Joyland, I highly recommend. Um, it, was, it's, it was Pakistan's official submission for Best International Feature this year, directed by Saeem Sadiq. I believe it won an award out of, in certain regard, at Cannes last year. Uh, and it's about a young man that falls in love with a trans woman in short uh, and i think it was uh might have been banned in pakistan it, it had kind of a, a there was a strong reaction to it but it was a really a well done film one true loves uh i think this is about a woman that thinks her ex is dead and has fallen in love with somebody else but the previous man comes back one of those scenarios oh. it's directed by andy fickman uh who you know as the director of that classic, You Again, starring Sigourney Weaver and Jamie Lee Curtis. Oh. Lastly, Showing Up. Showing Up, I would have loved to watch again. We didn't have time. Uh, but it, Kelly, a new Kelly Reichert film. It was in competition at Cannes last year, uh, starring the white Michelle Williams, who in a performance that I actually do like. Oh. Right? But... <laughs> um, yeah, so if you're a fan of anything Kelly Reichert does i'm gonna watch uh but it, it's i yeah i don't know it's not gonna i'm not it's not better than wendy and lucy which is a michelle williams film that she directed that i really loved but it's uh quite good okay moving on to projects of interest hamnet chloe zhao is apparently circling a new project uh the director of the rider and uh best picture winner nomad land and eternals uh, apparently she's looking at making a film about shakespeare's wife called hamnet ezekiel moss james gray looks to be directing i, I believe it's kind of a ghost story uh, but back in 2014 before he died philip seymour hoffman was trying to direct this so uh, it's a script that's been floating around for a while so that's interesting that um mr gray who usually i quite like as well will be doing that serpent's path uh, Kiyoshi Kurosawa, Japanese filmmaker, I quite like. I guess he's remaking a, I think it's a 1998 title he directed, which I haven't seen. Uh, it's hard to get a hold of, uh, but apparently he's remaking that in French. The Green Border. Um, Polish filmmaker Agnieszka Holland has a new film. Who works, you know, because she's not a young lady. She works quite. She's quite prolific, and she, she. It's a lot of projects off the ground. It's impressive, but um, I actually don't know what it's about. But Schrader, my one of my favorites, Paul Schrader. There was a a, a piece published a day or two ago because you know his wife is Mary Kay Place, um, and she has was diagnosed with Alzheimer's some time ago, and I think he had to move her into um, a facility that's actually not far from where I'm staying by the Hudson Yards. 
which reminds me, I want to rewatch that James Green movie, The Yards, because I haven't seen that in years. But apparently, he had to wife move his wife, and then he moved in with her, I think, on a separate floor. And he's been doing a ton of writing, I guess. And there was it was an announcement that he wrote a script that's going to be optioned by Elizabeth Moss to direct. He is going to adapt a novel by Russell Banks, uh, an author that he's adapted before with the film Affliction. Adam McGoin um, adapted Sweet Hereafter. That's a Russell Banks novel. But apparently that's going to reunite him with Richard Gere, who he directed in American Gigolo. And he is trying to get Antoine Fuqua to direct another f- film he wrote called Three Guns at Dawn. Hmm. And then I just saw, I thought that I, I didn't know this, but Mary J. Blige was on Stephen Colbert last week and she said that she wants to do a Nina Simone biopic. But I didn't know that she was supposed to star in the 2016 biopic, but there were like but like budget issues or something. And so that's how Zoe Saldana ended up playing that role. But um, yeah, I mean, I think just, just, instantly on site i feel like mary j blige would be a better choice for nina simone yeah. um you know with her voice and her appearance and then she was saying that she wants to learn how to play the piano for this role i would be excited for that movie yeah hopefully it's well you know nina that this better not be a pg-13 movie about nina simone <laughs> I know. So, well, you know, Mary can get kind of gritty because she's on that one show on Epics or Stars, that power book. I don't know anything about these because I don't support 50 Cent, but um, uh, I mean, apparently she gets pretty gritty on there. And well, then, she, you didn't see her in Mudbound. Uh, no. And then Tiana Taylor was on the Tamron Hall show saying that they're like in pre production for the Dionne Warwick biopic. That's right. I caught you were watching that when I was home. I would be excited about that too, especially after seeing her, Tayana, in A Thousand and One, where mm-hmm. I thought she was excellent. So, and she kind of favors Dion. So yeah, I, I think, yeah, I think if they focus on her early years um, with like Burt Bacharach and maybe like, you know, you know, there was a dark side to all that elevator music she was making. <laughs> I think it could be a really good movie. <laughs> Well, yeah, if you look at early pictures of Dion, she, yeah, she actually does, Tiana kind of does look like her. Yeah. Okay, movies we watched for fun. You watched The Irrational Man? Uh, j- just Irrational Man. You were in the room uh, that was Parker Posey and Walking Phoenix and Emma Stone, 2015 Woody Allen film that I rewatched. I hadn't seen since uh, I saw it, that played a can. Uh, Parker's definitely the best part of that movie. Um I don't know that it's aged well, but uh, his, you know, because Woody Allen would have these fascinations with actors, women usually. Uh, I, his little Emma Stone phase is not a favorite of mine. Oh, uh, personal velocity. You know, I haven't seen this since probably two thousand four. Uh, it won Sundance in two thousand three. Rebecca Miller, her second film with Kira Sedgwick. Parker and uh, Fruza Bulk telling three different stories about three different women. And it is, I quite like it. And uh, Parker's really good in it. Uh, but there's this omniscient narration that sounds like, some, it sounds like a written, like the novel, I'm sure, that is really unnecessary and kind of invasive. But uh, it was also enjoyable to rewatch, though. Highland Park. You know, so this is like a kind of a nothing indie film that has a really good cast, though. Danny Glover's in it. Um, but Parker is the uh, plays a corrupt mayor in it. And I referenced that in the the interview. I think she kind of laughed like, oh, God, nobody talks about that movie. Oh, the anniversary party. Uh, I also haven't seen this since. I don't know, almost damn near 20 years, but it's 2001 indie that was well favored at the time. And I don't know that it's aged that well in my mind because um, I, I think it's kind of ugly how it was shot, but it's about a bunch of assholes at a Los Angeles, a hoity-toity Los Angeles party uh, that was directed and starring, directed by Jennifer Jason Lee and Alan Cumming, who both star as a couple in it uh, with a whole bunch of notable 
cast members, but it's okay. Hemingway and Gellhorn. I'd never seen this. I didn't realize that Phil Kaufman directed this. The great uh, who directed um, the unbearable. He 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 adapted the unbearable lightness of being and uh, had the you know the excellent version of the invasion of the body snatchers from seventy eight. Uh, this was this was the last thing he did. It was made for HBO, and it played a can in 2012. And it stars Clive Owen and Nicole Kidman as Ernest Hemingway and uh, Marsha Gellhorn, uh, who were married. And she was a she was a writer. I have a a book of her collected writings that I've always that I've been meaning to read. But she was a, a war journalist correspondent, and they had a very tempestuous relationship. What I didn't know was that he based For Whom the Bell Tolls on her. Like she was the impetus for arguably what might be his best novel, but, and then how that fell apart. But par then Parker Posey plays his last wife. In mm -hmm. that. I'll save your next selection for later. And then I rewatched Red Dragon. With Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. Um, you know, it's too bad that it would have been so fun if, like, in the making of The Silence of the Lambs, when they realized, like, oh, we got something good, that they could have immediately said, you know what, let's do Red Dragon. So that, I don't know, it just feels so weird to have this movie happen 10 years later, but it's set right before Silence of the Lambs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, sequels weren't really the the thing then, and not you know, not the sounds of the lambs ninety one. I think sequels were still kind of looked down upon then. But can you imagine if Red Dragon would have been made like back to back with the Silence of the Lambs, and they dropped them like at the same time? That would well, have been major. <laughs> there was probably a, you know because Red Dragon was previously made into a film as Manhunter. Hmm. <laughs> You've seen with Michael Mann and Brian Cox is uh, a very good Hannibal Lecter as well. But I don't know, maybe there were sentiments that thought that was <clears throat> not the thing to do. Um, or why did it take Thomas Harris so long to write Hannibal? It's just you so know? corny. It's so corny at the end of Red, Red Dragon, how they allude to like Clarice Starling. Like, <laughs> yeah. I don't, think I don't think it's a good movie. I give it two and a half out of five. Um, you know, Anthony Hopkins is so sumptuous. Like, <laughs> he's so perfect. Uh, I really, I've always liked Ed Norton. Um, the script, I mean, it's engaging enough. Like, it kept my attention. Uh, and you got Joan, I, Joan Allen as the blind woman. The funniest part about that movie to me is that the killer played by Ray Fiennes, like his his sort of like a, a a big character trait of his is that he feels unappealing, which I find funny because he's very attractive. And the only thing that is like, I guess, abnormal, as they would say about him, is that he has like a corrected hair lip, which if he grew like a little bit of a stubble, you wouldn't even notice it. <laughs> And then he has like this perfect body. Like, what is wrong with him? I mean, clearly he's psychotic and a serial killer, but it it's kind of laughable to me. Okay. Unfortunately, there are entries in the obituary section. Bill Butler. Oh, yeah. The cinematographer on Spielberg's Jaws, he died. Norman Reynolds. Another Spielberg universe person, uh, art director, production designer on films like Star Wars and Raiders of the Lost Ark, he died. And then Ryu, Ryu, Ryuchi Sakamoto. I do know who that is because I saw that Madonna posted about him. Mm -hmm. uh, he was in one of her music videos, so I know that. Very prolific composer. Um, he did the score for the for Bertolucci's The Last Emperor, which of course won Best Picture, um, a film I like a little more than that was uh, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence. It's in uh, Nagisa Oshima film. And then he also did, uh, I mean, he's been working in a lot, a lot of major stuff recently. He did the score for The Revenant. All right. Our secret film for today was my choice. And I chose this film because a couple of weeks ago, um, 
or last week, I don't remember, we saw the new film Carmen. Last week, yeah. Starring Paul Mescal and who's the lady playing Carmen? Uh, Melissa Barrera. Anyway, I thought that movie is horrible. Our review for it drops tomorrow, I think. Oh, God. Yeah. Or, the, I... or this week. I don't know. It's it's coming, but that movie's horrible. So as we were as we were leaving, I thought, oh, I've never seen Carmen, a hip opera. Same. I'd never seen that either. <laughs> the 2001 American musical romantic drama television film produced by MTV and directed by Robert Townsend. Uh, this shit is terrible. It because I remember when we left the 2023 Carmen last week, I I was thinking Carmen a hip hopper can't be worse, and it is. It is. <laughs> it um, is. And yeah, sadly Beyonce is about as dead behind the eyes as Ms. Barrera. Um, oh, not only that, I thought speaking of Red Dragon, I thought Beyonce was giving that blind lady in Red Dragon. She's giving those eyes at points <laughs> like. <laughs> Oh my God, Beyonce can't act. You know how there's that clip of Wendy Williams as Kuka the alligator or Kuka the crocodile talking about okay, how, yeah. how, how Beyonce can't talk and she has like a fifth grade education. Um, um, um. <laughs> yeah, Beyonce cannot act. <laughs> but to be fair, I think there's been a progression because I think I actually like her performances at a James and Cadillac Records. You always want to cite Cadillac Records, but I think it's because in comparison to everything else she's done, Cadillac, her performance in Cadillac Records is elevated. Yeah. But I I didn't think she sent me anywhere in that movie either. Um, it's such an interesting, she's so interesting because if someone said to me, Beyonce is the greatest performer of all time, I'd be like, yeah, I, I wouldn't argue with that. Like on stage, I don't love all her music and, you know, she doesn't really write music and, <laughs> but she's a phenomenal performer and she transforms on stage, but somehow her acting is, couldn't be more stiff. And then her body language is very much like, like maybe she thinks she's on a stage. I don't know. Well, there's a scene where she's at because her her character, her Carmen, Carmen Brown, wants to be a an actress and they show her at an audition. Oh, I have a note that says, not this movie having <laughs> Carmen aspiring to be an actor, and then her acting's bad, but that it's like, so is the actor playing her. <laughs> that felt very meta. I felt like I was in a episode of The Twilight Zone with that scene. But anyway, this movie is like an urban like hip hop retelling of Carmen. And basically Beyonce plays Carmen. She is this seductive woman who has aspirations of being an actor. But, and we, and there's no character development for everyone. So all we know about Carmen is that she likes to spend time at a bar that's frequented by police officers. And we know that she frequents there because uh, when we first meet her, she gets into like a pretty aggressive like fight like where she's rolling around on the ground she pulls a chunk of hair out of someone and the bar owner played by fred williamson says i'm pressing charges this time which oh. means that not only <laughs> so this is not her first time at the rodeo like which is made even worse because she's supposed to be this seductive sultry woman and then she's a frequent patron of this bar and then when she gets in trouble no one sticks up for her <laughs> Oh, so I don't no. know what her M.O. is being in this bar with a bunch of police officers all the time. Well, when they come in there with that dumb looking rose and they're using what looks like the drag race season one filter on her. At many we'll, get times. To all, we'll get to all that. But anyway, so while she's there. Um, oh, God, this movie is so weird because it really should be about the man and the woman and how she's his demise. But in this retelling um they want to include a villain played by most deaf who's like a police sergeant or lieutenant mm -hmm. and makai pfeiffer plays a cop who is engaged mm -hmm. so he's at the bar the night beyonce gets into a fight and beyonce. yeah yeah and most and makai pfeiffer's there with his fiance and most deaf is there and most deaf and makai don't like each other And most deaf says, Makai, 
book Beyonce, like take her down to the station after she's already been flirting with him. His fiance got upset. Oh my God, this scene blew my mind. He gets her ass. So Makai gets Beyonce in the car and she's trying to seduce him and it's not working. And then she goes, well, can you at least take me home so I can drop off my ring because it's a ring my mom gave me. And I, and, and you know, if I go to jail with it, I'm never going to get it back. Yeah. And what's this dummy do? Agree to take her back to her house so she can change and like hide the ring. And of course, what does she do? Seduce him. And it happens lickety split. And she doesn't have to do a lot of work. Like, like very little work. And then we cut to the next morning. Carmen's gone, and most death is in her house arresting Mackay Pfeiffer. So he goes to jail. <laughs> he goes to like literal prison. And who is his cellmate in prison? Little Bow Wow. Like, he, a <laughs> yeah, a child, the child, Little Bow Wow. We need to talk about it. Okay. So, anyway, while he's in jail or prison, Beyonce writes him a love letter saying that she can't be without him. And then one night he he gets out without her knowing and shows up at her place. And he's like, I want to be with you. And she says, well, let's move to L.A. But and wait, wait, wait. He, when he gets out of jail, he just pops up in her bedroom. She goes, how did you get in? He's like, I saw the window open and I crawled in. Oh, we need to talk about all of this. I have so many notes. So they agree to go to L.A., even though they get into a big fight, because he's like, I can't go to L.A. I'm on parole and I can't leave the state. And she's mad about that. But they go anyway. So now he's a man on the run. They get to L.A. She wants to be an actor. She can't act. So that's not going to happen. And Makai can't get work because he's a convicted felon who's on the run. So everything culminates with there's this artist named blaze who's supposed to be like a big deal and beyonce decides that she's going to accept his inv like invitation to be like his lady and makai gets mad because beyonce breaks up with him so everything culminates with like blaze has a big show makai shows up to like get his woman back most deaf is in town because Another stupid side, this story is so bad, but another side thought is that most deaf is like internal affairs is on his ass. And he knows that the only person who could really do him in is Makai Pfeiffer, because we can talk about it, that Makai knows some stuff about most deaf. So most deaf is in town in LA to kill Makai Pfeiffer, but in the process kills Beyonce. And then Makai kills most deaf. And then Makai ends up in prison. The end. This story Ooh. is okay. I'm just gonna. I have something. I'm just gonna go down the line. I have never been more confused or distracted by a character's hair in my entire cinematic history. If I've watched thousands of movies, I have never been so distracted by someone's hair. And that person's hair is Beyonce's. This is back when Mama Tina was doing her hair and she used to like to wear the individual braids and then like, you know, they only braid them so far so the rest you can do more with. I don't think that it's the worst. I don't like it and it looks ratty most of the time. My issue is her hairstyle changes in every scene. Literally every fucking this is the one f word i'm going to use seen in this movie her hair is different and in some cases there's one time when when Car when we first meet carmen she's like dressed more sort of like you know 1950 you know like va va boom and she has like the waves like the veronica lake it, it looks kind of raggedy in the back it's very matted but she has that with a little rose in her hair Oh God, that stupid rose. <laughs> but she looks good. She looks then, good. But... I mean, the hair doesn't, but she does. Then, so then she gets arrested. Then Makai takes her to her house and she goes into the bedroom. And then when she reappears, not only has she had time to change into a negligee, she has changed her makeup and she has her hair in a full updo. 
Yep. Like it has been pinned and curled. Unbelievable. Then there's another scene where I believe her hair changes. Oh, it's when she goes to the club with her girlfriends to meet Blaze. When she's sitting at the house that night before they go out, her hair is down and kind of like raggedy. Then when they get to the bar, her shit is, it looks like they did like Shirley Temple curls. Then when she gets back home the same night, she braided all of her hair into cornrows. And then that's the same night when Makai Pfeiffer pops up all of a sudden and she has her hair like straightened in a ponytail. She has yeah. four completely different looks. In one day. In, in one, not even a full day, like one night. It is insane. And I don't know how it made sense because that was only probably more difficult for whoever was styling her. I'm assuming a lot of this movie was shot like all over the place maybe. And that's uh, yeah, what makes well, it, it, it was made for TV. So I guess they thought that they could be real sloppy with it. because I guess. Okay, so talking about Robert Townsend, who directed it, he's done two movies I love, Holiday Heart and Jackie's Back. And then you know him for even more things. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's very prolific. Hollywood Shuffle, uh, which you've seen. I thought you liked that one a lot, too. But, um, yeah, I think it's shockingly bad. And it was written by somebody named Michael Elliott, first script, produced script, who'd go on to do Like Mike, with Bow Wow, if you remember that movie, and Brown Sugar, uh, it Just Right with Queen Latifah. Uh, he did a TV movie with Tammy Roman called Wifey, which I'd be interested in checking out. But yeah, I don't know. This The yeah. writing is really bad. The story is so bad. It's all over the place. There is zero depth to anything. Okay. Well, nothing makes sense. Like Nothing makes sense, no. When Blaze is like, telling Carmen to come to LA and basically you and your girlfriends will make you stars and they're just like we're going to Cali tonight <laughs> yeah okay the opening is so it's being narrated like bookended with narration by Debrat that's right and the overhead shots and the slow-mos within the first three minutes were too much and I recognize a lot of Robert Townsend's like techniques from like Jackie's back mm -hmm. like the split screen gliding over and lots of slow-mos blurry uh color use that's not like unfamiliar to me from him but in this movie it just feels so like if you told me this was someone's first film I would still think it's horrible and this is like a seasoned filmmaker who has done things that are much better I don't know how, maybe he was mad at MTV and thought he was going to ruin the project <laughs> because it's so terrible. Okay, it is a moment because it's early 2000s. You have a lot of really notable people from like hip hop and R&B. You have people from Black Hollywood. So the cast is really impressive. The yeah. one compliment I will give is that the music for 2001 standards is like, I enjoyed it. N not like I would play it again in my car, but like I, if I would have watched this in 2001, it would have it would have connected better than it does today. And I do think whoever wrote the lyrics to the songs, while, yeah. while ridiculous, they did put a lot of effort into it. <laughs> they did, but sometimes these tracks start getting real corny they're super uh, corny and the the lyrics tell us more about the characters than the movie which that's usually what a musical i mean that's not that's appropriate but i think in this instance because the movie is so bad <laughs> it's just so insane that we're getting more from these horrible corny songs than we are the motion picture we're watching oh god when when beyonce is doing the letter writing and she's acting uh the emotions of the letter that poor thing okay mckay pfeiffer's girlfriend michaela who i recognize um she reagan gomez preston she was on a show called the parenthood on the wb that's what i remember her from she's beautiful mm -hmm. 
I almost feel like she would have made a better Carmen. I mean, Beyonce's beautiful, but she's not the most beautiful woman in the movie. I thought her friend was prettier or Michaela. So I don't know. Rod, Rod Digger. And then I I like Rod Digger. Um, I like some of the songs she's done with Buster Rhymes, but it was a little hard for me to believe that Blaze wanted to fly Raw Digga out. I could see him flying Beyonce and her other friend out, but not oh. Raw Digga. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Raw Digga and Rashida. But Raw Digga has some line w- w- to um, Beyonce, because Beyonce said she's going to stay behind. She's Carmen's not going to go to LA. She's got to wait for uh, Hill to get out of prison. Uh, and Rod Digger goes, you going to stay here and put your dreams on hold? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> I was say about, what I was going to say about Michaela is she is engaged to Makai, who is a cop. And then when we first meet them at the bar, she's mad at him. And he's like, what is wrong? And she goes, well, you and this cop thing. You mean his career? Like... <laughs> excuse me that's his career like if you don't want to be married to a cop then i think you probably shouldn't be engaged but she says it like like it's something inconsequential it is his whole ass career what is he supposed to do (laughs) this it seems like nobody that was writing this it's it's odd because townsend's worked in the industry so long it feels like the film has no clue one about being a policeman but also what what an entertainment career is like. Right. Okay. Makai and Most Deaf, first of all, we have people in this film who have shown they can act in other things, but in this movie, no one is demonstrating any acting skills. Most Deaf mm, hit a lot of false notes for me. Yeah, he was... uh, Well, part of it's the ADR, but also, like, oh, he's just so smarmy and not in a good way because he almost looks like a joke to me mm-hmm. being this villain. But we see that there's tension between Mo- Most Def and Mackay Pfeiffer because in the opening, we see Most Def planting drugs on Little Bow Wow <laughs> and Mackay sees it and tries to stop it. And that's when Most Def puts him in his place and tells him to take him in. And then later on, we see that Makai Pfeiffer and Little Bow Wow are in the same prison cell. In yeah. Prison, like, I don't understand. Like, there are moments that seem, like, deliberately comedic. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand why we needed that. Also, Fred Williamson, <laughs> he only serves the one purpose of complaining about cops in a bar he owns that is pretty much only frequented by cops by cops all the time all day long are <laughs> the, the cops are there <clears throat> okay and then, uh, I, another line that i liked is i think it's when carmen's with blaze and she says you see i have dreams because <laughs> it's a combination of the stupidity and then her beyonce's line delivery is you know well, no, it, I, I think the same thing you're talking about, she says to him twice, do you really want to know? Because he's like, well, how are you doing? And she's like, do you really want to know? And then he asks her, what are your dreams? Do you really want to know? <laughs> oh my God, when her friends are, when the the fateful night of leaving for Cali and they hug her. Oh, they- not only that, they make a music video. There's like a little break and then we get a music video <laughs> of the three of them talking about going to Cali. That shit is atrocious. It is <laughs> atrocious. But it's like none of these bitches are packed to go to. Like, so, do they all live together? I was so confused. Like, who? Oh my god! Then when Makai shows up after he's left prison, and Carmen Beyonce is mad because he can't leave the state. He's like, I'm gonna be on probation at least a year. She's like, what? And they're arguing. And then in the end, she goes, well, if you don't do it, if not for me, then do it for the weather. (laughs) What? Yeah, please. Then then I, the opening of the film, it wasn't clear to me that Michaela works in the cop bar. I thought she was just hanging out there. 
That's right. Mm -hmm. Because she get because then we see Mikai go back to the bar after he's after Michaela's broken up with him and she's upset. And my initial thought was like, why are you still hanging out at the cop bar? But then we see later on in the film that she actually works there. That was bad writing. Like, why does Michaela work at the cop bar and then got engaged to a cop, but she doesn't want to deal with the cop thing? Okay. So then when Makai and Beyonce finally go to Cali, they drive. And we get like a green screen montage that is... It's bad. It's like a fever dream. <laughs> mm -hmm. It needed to be more David Lynchian, perhaps, but... And then oh. that and then that little montage is uh, the soundtrack to that is Destiny's Child Survivor. <laughs> they were already like, I mean, Beyonce was already like on the rise. So I know other bigger artists like Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, they've done really bad movies, right? As their career was like really exploding. I'm just so surprised that Beyonce hasn't like try to buy the rights to this film and destroy it like I, <laughs> she has the money to do so um, yeah then when they get to LA why did they have to check in like I understand that they didn't have money so their accommodations wouldn't be the best but they check into a dirty hotel room how does that make sense <laughs> it doesn't like just like and also uh, especially in 2001 I don't know that across state lines because because it's a plot point he can't find work because he's a wanted man but it's like his offense nobody's checking for this man yeah he's not on the run he's just breaking parole right so, nobody is it's so stupid it's just like he was in prison and nobody was gonna get him he wasn't gonna get bail all he did was uh allow he allowed a, a woman to escape arrest and for that, and, and then they know where she lives and don't go arrest her again. Most FCs. Well, the charge was aiding and abetting. Right. But yeah, I mean, but but that's because most deaf doesn't like him. But when they're when they get to LA, most deaf tells her, like, I'll get up in the morning to find a job so I can get us out of here. And it's like, but you're a police officer. You should know that like your criminal record and the fact that you're breaking parole is not going to allow you to find work. And then we get a montage of him trying to find work. And all it amounts to is all these people holding his application and shaking their head no. <laughs> Except for the one, the guy at the janitorial services who ends up telling, who finds out he's a wanted man and tells him, you're as dirty as they come. And then if you knew, if that's how you feel about it, why didn't you call the police the minute you found out? Yeah, why, why would you wait for him to confront you? And Why would you wait for him to confront you, which you weren't? you wouldn't have known that he would have because you already told him he couldn't have the job. That was so stupid. We need to talk about Carmen's audition again because <laughs> I don't think her character was supposed to be bad. Like, I, I, I think it was supposed to be a real audition. It's just that Beyonce can't act. So then it becomes meta. And then the casting person is telling her, can you act more Black? Can you act more like Shanene? And then... Yeah. And then she just, and Beyonce can't do it or doesn't do it immediately. So the woman she pauses. Yeah. But again, that's the problem with that scene is that she's not any, you're supposed to feel like, oh, this woman has talent and they are just making her do that thing. Right. They're, they're demeaning her talent, but it's like, well, well, but, and you know, again, speaking of Hollywood shuffle, that's something that Townsend has explored before, but. Uh, it doesn't work in that scene. So after she is disappointed with her casting failure, her audition fail, and she gets into an argument with, with Mackay Pfeiffer, then we get a scene where she's walking down the street and just randomly bumps into her homegirls. Like, she's just walking down the street and then she sees her friends and she's like, oh, hey. <laughs> <laughs> like, Los Angeles is a very big city. Uh, and you just randomly walked into your two friends and then they go to a tarot card reader played by Wyclef. And that scene was atrocious. It's really bad. He's really bad. He's super bad. And then I would say his song is probably the worst song in the movie. 
And then he's telling her, like, you're doomed. Like, you're going to die. He tells the other two ladies reading their cards, like, you have a bright future. And to Beyonce, he's like, every card she pulls is like, doom, sorrow, death, 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 death. Like, death card came so much that I thought it must have been, a, the card must be all death cards, because there's no way. It came, like, five times. Yeah. Okay. Then we get a scene with Blaze, that famous rapper who's brought the three ladies to L.A., He's doing like a rehearsal performance. That shit was garbage. Like, <laughs> there's no way that person is a big star. Um, so then, of course, if it wasn't subtle enough that she's gonna die, then we get a scene where she's in the bathtub, and when she, and as soon as she gets out of the bathtub, the CD player falls into the. Yeah. <laughs> um. Then Makai. So he has a friend, like his partner, like a police officer, and most deaf has paid this friend like $50,000 to tell him where Makai is so he can go kill him. And then one night, Makai calls his partner out of the blue, basically to vent to him. He's like, uh, like talking about Carmen. I love her. She's the air that I breathe. Why did he need to call this man and tell him that? And then he basically says, like, I'm going to go down to this concert and get her. Why did you need to tell him that? I don't know. That's I, I don't think Mackay Fiverr's he's okay in this, but yeah, there are moments the emotions of tumultuous passion. No one gets quite right. The, neither does most deaf who's screaming, "Find Hill!" It gets well. Just... Yeah, Mackay Fiverr's acting is the best out of everyone, but it's still not good. It's but good. I think it's the script, not him. And we uh, forgot to have Jermaine Dupree as pockets. It, it's like, it's really cool that you got like notable people in this cast, but the problem is like none of them can act, at least not in this movie. So then it's just like so useless and <laughs> it's kind of painful to watch. <laughs> this was, this was, well, I don't like Natalie Portman's husband's Carmen either. That that was painful to watch in a different way. I yeah. will say, Carmen and Hip Hop was more entertaining because I was sitting here in this hotel room howling at this dialogue. But yeah, I I, I wish I could have watched this, or I wish I would not have watched this alone because I was just sitting there with my head spinning. When when we see Blaze's like big performance, did you notice the costumes of the backup dancers? I don't know. That was the ugliest, most hideous, cheap shit you've ever seen. It looked like someone took, like, Christmas tinsel and made, like, skirts out of them. And then they had these, like, lame tops on. They looked insane. Like, insane. I think I was distracted by Blaze's uh, handkerchief on his oh, head. Um, so when Makai finally shows up at the concert and gets uh, Beyonce... He's like grabbing her, telling her like, we need to go. And she says at least 10 times, let go of me. She says. And I thought that would have been a better title for this movie <laughs> is let go of me. <laughs> well, the, Carmen is uh, usually killed by his character. Like, so, it, oh, yeah. So then that brings us to my next note. So then when Makai, when Most Def goes to shoot Makai, he accidentally shoots Beyonce. Is it and an accident? It seemed pretty on purpose. Well, and then when he goes to shoot Makai, he's out of bullets. Yeah, he had two bullets. And then when he catches up to, yeah, so he only shot the gun twice, and then he's it, out of bullets. Like, what gun like that holds two bullets? Then when not- and with a silencer. And then when Makai catches up to him, Most Def tries to shoot him again, but he knows he doesn't have bullets. So of course Makai gets the upper hand and kills Most Def. I thought that was so stupid. It was very stupid. <laughs> Just all um, no, the I should re- I haven't watched Carmen Jones in years, but I feel like you need to because well here let me finish so so then of course now Makai's being arrested and so while he's like on the ground with his hands behind his head we're getting a flashback of like the beginning of the movie like a pretty long flashback and I thought 
for a movie this horrible that's only 85 minutes we did not need like a big flashback of all the basically it was like a fast rewind of all of the scenes with Carmen mm -hmm. that was terrible um and then this movie has the nerve to have bloopers. Did you watch the bloopers? I did not watch the bloopers. I turned this off as fast as I could. It's embarrassing to have a movie this bad and then have the nerve to have bloopers. And one of the bloopers is actually, because this movie is already a joke, but one of the bloopers is um, we see Beyonce walk by in her red dress and, and then two extras are like ogling her. And then you hear... I, I believe it's Robert Townsend telling them, like, don't look at her butt like that. And I thought that was a really weird thing to include. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the worry. only positive for me is whomever wrote the lyrics, I'm assuming it's the person who wrote the screenplay, they did put a lot of effort into that. So I do applaud that. Well, Michael, Michael Elliott wrote the screenplay, but Roscoe is credited with the story soundtrack. Oh, so, I mean, I will give it credit that a lot of work went into it, albeit these lyrics. I mean, I stopped trying to, I, I was going to start writing down lines that made me like cringe, but there were too many. So I stopped. Um, my like final, a, I'll go ahead. A, new, a nuisance. You're being a nuisance. Oh, there are so many. Okay. So my final note was that someone needs to remake this as like a play, like a community theater play. You know, like one of those the little the theaters on like Santa Monica and Coanga. Someone needs to redo Carmen a hip hopera, like word for word. And I think it would be hilarious. Kind of like what they've done to showgirls. Yeah, how like uh uh Peaches Christ and Hecklina will do like rest in peace, Hecklina. Oh, we didn't even include that in the obituaries, but that's noted, right. Noted drag queen Hecklina passed away. But um, yeah, um, someone needs to redo this as a stage play. Because... Yeah, it's, it's not a bad idea. I mean, again, we've already modified Carmen many times over, but this isn't a bad idea per se. And it would be interesting to have like an actual pop diva star in this kind of version of it. But th this is not this is not it. Um, I also happen to have watched Carlos Sora's 1983 film, Carmen, uh, for the first time this past week, which is about somebody that's putting on a production of Carmen. And I was, which is a much better film, uh, but I was laughing because the lead that he casts as Carmen is in this film is not the best dancer. And he's going in hard on training her. And it's like, somebody needed to do that with uh, Beyonce and Melissa Barrera. <laughs> with their acting? <laughs> yeah. Receiving these these notes. What would you give this movie? Uh, like one and a half would be is being very nice. Oh, I'm giving it one out of five. Okay. Well, because I give I'm not giving it point five is because I do appreciate the lyrical, the work that went into the lyrics, not necessarily the lyrical content. But yeah, that was kind of my impetus for the one point five because I gave uh, the new one a one. But well, this one is worse in that like as uh like robert townsend as a filmmaker i mean this is embarrassing uh the new carmen i think is very well made and beautifully shot so i gave that movie i think one and a half but then that story is insanely stupid too so yeah and unfortunately like the music in, well, in the new carmen the musicality is not really there like there are no songs that people are performing like as a musical there are songs that like characters sing like to a there kid are. or like random but 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 there are no performances like this movie feels like what you think of a musical where like oh characters are just bursting out into song to tell this story um it's, it's just that the style of music you know, becomes dated, like, this is not timeless, right? Like, this version of R&B and hip-hop, you know, we, we 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 would have known in 2001 that this will not age well, but... Yeah. And it surely didn't. Is there anything else you want to say? 
uh, should rewatch the Sora film from 83 or rewatch the 50s version with uh, Dorothy Dandridge? Well, I feel like you should probably, well, I guess I should watch the Carmen, I should watch Carmen Jones. I don't know when. Um, okay, what do we have this week? Carmen coming out, Renfield. Renfield's this week. Um, I'm taking you to see Bo is Afraid. Um, I do not want to watch that movie. <laughs> I guess uh, I will, but it's definitely the kind of film that is worth talking. Like it's necessary to talk about. I think, like, because if I would, because I've already seen it, obviously, but um, just to rattle off what it's about is not going to be like like we need to get into it on it. But uh, and then of course I talked at length with Parker Posey about it. Uh, but that's this week. I think there's a new Guy Ritchie film. Uh, that Russell Crowe film, The Pope's Exorcist, is this week. Oh, did you watch Mafia Mama yet? No. no. Um, but I think that's all we have. Okay. All right. Ta-ta. Bye. Bye.